Hi everyone and welcome back to Pushing the Limits. This week I have Trevor and Angie from the Marathon Training Academy. It's super exciting to have you guys. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Lisa. It's great to be here. Yeah, we're excited about this. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I found you actually uh, through a mutual friend, Dean Canassis, who I know you've had on the show a couple of times, yeah. and Dean's been a, a huge uh, influence in my life, as you can possibly imagine, and I owe him so much, um, both as a role model and as a friend who's done lots of things for us, so um, he's a wonderful guy, so shout out to Dean, who I think mm -hmm. has just got out of lockdown in Australia, <laughs> hopefully he's out <laughs> yeah. now, um, yeah. and who was intending to run around Australia, and that's been curtailed because of the bloody COVID thing. Um, but yeah, shout out to Dean. Thanks for introducing us. And I just loved your show. So I thought, well, yeah, got to have you guys on. Um, awesome. So you guys are uh, running coaches <clears throat> and um, you have three kids. Um, let's start there. Tell us a little bit about your, your, your training academy and what you do and your podcast and, and all of that sort of good stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, thanks for the opportunity to be on the podcast here and I'll, I'll introduce myself. This is Trevor. I am America's most okayest runner. <laughs> I thought you were going to say laziest. <laughs> laziest? No. Um, no, that's me. <laughs> of course, Angie's my better half. She's she's actually the running coach. I'm more of like the the business guy behind the behind the scenes. But um, we uh, we started in 2010. We launched the Marathon Training Academy podcast because we figured, hey, maybe. You know, Angie had some knowledge and experience running a couple of marathons. Maybe people would benefit from learning how to do it. So we launched it and uh, have been pretty much releasing content consistently for the last 11 years. It is not easy, as you know. <laughs> no, it is not. That is so, so impressive to keep going for that long. We, we've, we've been going five and a half years and I thought I was ancient in, in the podcast space. Yeah. So, so amazing. And, you know, you've got a huge following and a huge, you know, you're telling me some of your download stats and I'm like, oh, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> you guys, you guys are rock stars. I, well, I guess we've been fortunate in the beginning when we launched. I don't think there was a lot of competition for what we we're talking about there, at least in the U S on iTunes, there was podcasts where people would carry a recorder out when they ran and they would just dictate breathing really heavy into the mic and stuff. But there wasn't a whole lot of like prescriptive uh, training advice, which is what, what we try to do. I mean, we tell stories and we do race recaps and take people, you know, with us as we go racing around the country. But uh, we try to be like prescriptive, sharing lots of tips and strategies and principles Angie's also a registered nurse and uh, as well as being a running coach. So that appealed to people and it just took off in the beginning. We got lucky. I guess it was dumb luck. I don't know. But <laughs> we uh, we started uh, connecting with people right away, uh, folks that would email us from all over the world. And uh, we've just had a, a great audience ever since. And uh, I just checked the numbers today. And we've Our show has been downloaded uh, 10.8 million times since insane. we started. Insane. That is insane. I got a long way to go to catch up to you guys. <laughs> you guys are rock stars. And Angie, you are a, a legend in the running space. So you've already done what, 50 marathons in 50 states, for one thing. Um, tell us a bit about your career. Well, I definitely don't feel like a legend. I guess that's, you know, when you are the person who is, is doing it all, you always kind of feel like, wow, I. I kind of feel like there was still so much that could be accomplished. There's, you know, there's always like that comparison trap we can fit ourselves into. Like there's mm -hmm. always someone yeah. who can run faster unless you're Elliot Kipchoge. Yeah. There's always exactly. someone who's done more crazy challenges. So I think, you know, it's kind of, that's a dangerous, um, dangerous field to start comparing yourself to other people. But I will say that I started running off and on when I was a teenager and I, didn't have a great motivation. It was more about trying to lose weight. Yes. And when I didn't see instant right. results, then I would kind of give it up and be like, oh, you know, this isn't working. But I do feel like I really finally became a runner in my late twenties. Mm -hmm. uh, we had moved across the country. It was a move that I really didn't want to make. It was for work. And I had two little kids at home and I just felt like I was stuck and I needed a new challenge. And so kind of on a whim, I signed up for a 5k race. And they say the 5k is the gateway drug to long distance running. <laughs> I <And> love it. <laughs> in so my case, true. it was, it was like a completely miserable race. It was hot and humid and I'm not a good hot weather runner. Um, 
but I felt like there's like a spark inside me. Like this is something that really fired me up. Like it wasn't about beating other people. In fact, you know, I had a very, very average time, (laughs) but I just kind of felt like, wow, I bet you I can get better at this. And I'd never considered myself an athlete before. I never played any sports. So running was something, it was just kind of me against me. And I decided I needed a bigger challenge. So I signed up for my first marathon. And at the Sweet. time I didn't, I didn't have any friends who were runners. This, you know, they probably would have advised me against it. Actually. <laughs> yep. I didn't know anyone who'd ever done a marathon before. In fact, at the time we were so poor that I could either afford the race registration or a new pair of shoes. And so, <laughs> so my mom actually paid for my race registration. So I consider her my first like official sponsor because she got me going. <laughs> Love it. So I'm training for this marathon on my own. Long story short, I do everything wrong. You know, I just run, I don't do any kind of recovery or cross training or strength training. And I'm getting injured, dealing with back pain and IT band pain and all the things. But I was stubborn enough that I kept going and was able to finish the marathon. And although, you know, it felt completely grueling at times, just when I crossed that finish line, it really, I was like, wow, I know I'm going to do this again. And it, that kind of just started my journey. I actually, after that first marathon had to take three months off of running because my IT band was so bad, had knee pain, the whole nine yards. And that's when I started doing yoga and kind of discovered like, wow, I can really start to learn more about my body and not ignore these signals that it's sending me, you know, like there are some areas that need to be strengthened. And I think that kind of sowed the seeds for what became Marathon Training Academy, because I mm-hmm. wanted to help people have a better experience than I did the first time, like have the knowledge, have the information to not get injured and not have to do things the hard way. Um, and so I went on to run my second marathon training much smarter and was able to break four hours for the first time, which was a huge goal of mine. And so I think that's kind of when Trevor mentioned wanting to start a podcast and about marathon training, I was like, well, I don't feel like I know enough, you know, (laughs) and like, who's going to listen to us? We're just sitting in our living room recording this thing. This, you know, I had very, very low aspirations for where it was going to go, but um, he had the vision and, you know, we stuck with it and just have had a very, wonderful, gracious audience. And we've just, you know, been able to meet so many amazing people throughout the years. And I think that's been the most rewarding part of it. That's amazing. Um, Trevor, your wife's a bit of a, a superstar with the sounds of it. She's just like a very humble. <laughs> oh, she's amazing. She puts me to shame. Like she does everything that you're supposed to do, like that your coach tells you that, that you see on your training plan, doesn't miss a day, doesn't miss a workout. And, and I do like 25% of my training plan. <laughs> Probably 50%. Okay. <laughs> That's brilliant though. But I, I love that the fact that you like, cause you know, like me, when I started running, I had no idea what the hell I was doing. I just put one foot in front of the other and, and mm-hmm. I was hopeless and I was slow and I'm still slow. Um, <laughs> even 25 years later and, you know, <clears throat> genetically speaking, not the most gifted person in the world, but very, very stubborn. And that's mm-hmm. all you need with running. And it is, I love that you yeah. are all about, the everyday runner. Um, we, we have a, a, a running coaching arm of our company as well. And, and we are very much into that holistic approach to running too, with our strength and the mobility and the mindset and the nutrition and all of that sort of stuff that I had no idea about of back in the day. And I just bumbled along running <laughs> long because that's what you did, isn't it? You know, you just, if you're going to run long, you run long. What the hell is strength training? What do I need that for? Um, um, so I think we you know we're both bumbled on into the space and, and, this is the key thing I think from your story is that uh, when you just keep going and keep going and keep going you suddenly find yourself looking back on like holy heck I've done a lot <laughs> I've done some pretty amazing sure. things um, and then it's, so it's it's a it's just like running is put one step in front of the other and then being open to learning getting good coaching getting you know so that you because I like what you said Ange about um making mistakes and then not wanting other people to make them and that is just that's the motivation for what we do too because I reinvented the entire wheel and you don't (laughs) need to and you know like do you find a lot of runners come and they um or they don't think they need a coach for starters (laughs) most people only come to you when they're injured is that what happens to you guys as well 
Yeah, I think, you know, often there is part of human nature and, and I think certain personality types who are more driven to like, I'm going to do this myself and I'm stubborn and I'm going to see this through. Um, and yeah, they, maybe they've tried a few times to hit a specific time goal that they have and they realize, wow, this is, is you know, it's not going in the direction that I thought it should be going or the injury issues. Um, and, you know, we do have, I think people's knowledge and information is it's, it's better now. There's so mm. much more out there that a lot of people who are probably smarter than I was are like, Hey, I can probably <laughs> cut out the injury part and I can get good advice and good help, um, in the beginning and make this so much, you know, better journey. And I think also for me, I went at alone, you know, for the first few years and just being part of a community makes it so much more special. And I think the running community is just amazing. You know, you meet the best people and mm -hmm. have conversations with people like you. And it's just, I think doing things in community makes um, it so, so much richer. Oh man, I could learn so much from you guys. I reckon, you know, I think you've got a really good approach to it. So Trevor, what do you, you know, like, um, looking back at you know in the podcast space because you you're you're the business you, you say you're the businessman behind the 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 amazing lady um <laughs> <laughs> got any tips for a podcaster because <laughs> obviously you guys are doing something right so you started off in this space like you've grown this massively um and I, I know what goes into it and you know when you come to it a bit later it's been a bit harder for sure what have you learned on that journey from a you know community building point of view because I feel like we've still got work to do in that space and you know I'm always keen to learn from people who are so successful yeah. well one thing when Angie was talking and she was uh, telling the story of when I pitched the podcast idea to her uh, <laughs> one thing she didn't tell you was her first response was because this is 2010, or actually 09 when I pitched the idea. Her first response was, what's a podcast? Yeah, that was <laughs> yeah. 100%, yeah, yeah. totally it's, ignorant. Yeah, well, so, you still get people not knowing what the hell a podcast is. <laughs> yeah, so I think getting in early obviously was a big help to us kind of to be on the front end of a trend. We actually started in what was called the, the second wave of podcasting. So Podcasting got going in earnest around 06. So they say that was the first wave. And then around 2010 was the second wave. There's a lot more shows starting. And now we're, we might be in, you know, the fourth wave of podcasting now where almost every major company has a podcast, uh, every news agency and every, you know, late night TV show host. So it, it's definitely a more crowded space. But on the other hand, um, there are still people, like you said, who've never heard of a podcast. Mm. More and more people are coming to the medium, uh, downloading shows, and uh, podcasting is becoming more mainstream. Uh, I know here, at least in the US, <clears throat> it's mm -hmm. not unusual to hear people on TV talk about podcasts. Just just in anywhere you look, you know, you can see subscribe to my podcast. So it's cool to see the cultural awareness rise since we've started. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's in terms of like tips on growing a show and community, uh, one thing that helped us in the beginning and still helps us is uh, hearing from listeners, featuring their stories. Yeah, at the, the top of our show, every episode we do shout outs where kind of like a virtual high five. And people are like, like all of us, people love to hear uh, their name. Hey, name. Yeah. <laughs> podcast. Excellent. It just makes them feel, yeah, lights them up. It puts a smile on their face. And uh, we, we try to do that a lot where we, uh, engage the audience that way so and then you know the off off podcast stuff too is also important like our social yeah. media stuff and yep all SEO that. and all of that yeah <laughs> building stuff. community and we also yeah. kind of try to keep in top of mind like what's in it for the listener because yeah, exactly. at the end of the day people only have so much brain space and time and so they're going to keep listening to shows that they feel like are giving them good value and you know that they connect to in some way and so i think just keeping that it listener focused and stuff, you know, no one wants to hear about like a dissertation of what we've been doing for the last week in depth. You know, they want to, feel, yeah, they, exactly. want to they want to get know, straight to the point. They, they want to get to know us a little yeah. bit, but they also want to know that we care about their needs and everything and, and what's top of mind. Yeah. So I think that's been helpful as well. Yeah. I, I edit our show judiciously. And really? If, 
Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and if I spend way good. too much time. I'm, I'm just a perfectionist with, <laughs> with it. And I haven't been able to outsource that yet. So I edit our show and I'm like, I don't know what the word is. I'm just a stickler when it comes to audio quality. And also, like Angie said, I know people's time is important. So if, if we go down a certain path in the conversation that I think is not pertinent enough, I'll just cut it, you know? Yep. So I'll just, just, I'll take Pretty a sure. one hour episode, maybe sometimes cut it down to 40 minutes. Yeah. And he has yeah. to edit out all my likes and, you know, all my verbal clutter. So <laughs> it takes about half of the content away. <laughs> and it's so much work. Hey, eh? like that whole oh, side yeah. of things is just so much work, but I love that you, you do that and you're a perfectionist and um, having, you know, I'm, I'm technically completely disabled and um, <laughs> I have a team <laughs> of people behind me doing a lot of the stuff, but we can still improve and, and get better. But yeah, I love the meandering type of conversations that we have. So uh, let's go and um, talk a little bit about, I mean, for a start, Angie, I do have to ask you about your 50 marathons in 50 states, but like our friend Dean, um, how did that come about? And like, what, when, did you, when did this become a challenge? Well, you know, sometimes things just kind of sneak up on you. And I think it was at my fourth marathon and it was before the race. And I was sitting around talking to a couple of ladies and they had these shirts on that said marathon maniacs. And so I was like, what do those shirts mean? Like, what's a marathon maniac? And they're like, oh, it's a club where you have to run a certain number of marathons to be able to get in. And I was like, oh, like how many? And they said, well, you have to do two in two weeks or three in 90 days. And wow. I was like, what? That's, that's crazy. You know, yeah. like that's, that's a maniac. You know, I was like, I could never do that. And so I said that to, I could never do that. And they're like, oh, you could, if you really wanted to. And that just kind of stuck with me. I was like, you know, a lot of times we make excuses why we can't do something. And sometimes it seems very valid at the moment, but it's all a matter of priorities. And that mm -hmm. like stuck with me. I'm like, could I do that? And so later that fall, I did end up doing three marathons in that 90 day space. And I became a marathon maniac. And so when you surround yourself with people who are doing all these big challenges, like mm -hmm. I would joke that I was like a baby maniac because there was people who had done like three, four, 500 marathons in the wow. club that you would see at these races. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, of course the, I heard about the 50 state club. So people who run a marathon in each of the 50 states. And I thought, wow, that would be cool. You know, I already have a few states under my belt. Like, why not? You know, it doesn't have to be anything like Dean Carnaz is doing in 50 days. Yeah. It can take, you know, who can, you know, no one cares like how long it takes and everything. And both Trevor and I love to travel. And so it seemed like a really great way to be able to explore our very diverse country and see all these amazing places, get to run, and so it just kind of, you know, started that, that way and it took me 12 years to finish all 50 wow. states, but you know, it's about the journey and not the destination. So. Oh, absolutely. That, and that is a re that rolls off the tongue really beautifully. Yeah. I've done a marathon in every state, 50 states, you know, like that's here's, just <laughs> here's what's cool. Uh, Lisa, I don't know if Angie would, is going to tell you this, but she actually ran her last marathon fastest. Her, that was her fastest marathon. And that's, that's what's so cool about our sport is that even though you get older, you can still improve in so many ways. Yep. So her, her very 50th state was in Hawaii. She ran 319, qualified for Boston by 20 minutes. And that was at the age of 41. So she was, she was running, she was 10 years older, but ran an hour faster than when she started. I love it. Go the oldies. <laughs> I'm way older than you, so I can say that. <laughs> um, and, 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 and I totally agree. Like it is, you know, endurance is one of those things. I, I read a statistic once that a 19-year-old and a 64-year-old are on the same level of endurance or something, and you peak around mm -hmm. 48 as far as endurance goes. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm into that. <laughs> and, yeah. and I, like I had similar stories. I did my best performances in my... 42 43 around that era, around mm. that age with my, my peak performances um i'm way after that now so things have slid off the hill a little bit um, <laughs> but um you know and, and and of course it's what's going on in your life i've had a few other dramas in my life so you know there's mm -hmm. reasons for things slipping off but 
Um, I, I love that. And 319 is an incredible time. And that's just amazing. And I think, yeah, was- I still can't believe I did that actually. Yeah. <laughs> was that me? I don't know. It was just one of those days where everything comes together and, and you, yeah. you can Hawaii. never like predict that. In so. Hawaii. Yeah. In Hawaii to boot. <laughs> yeah. Like, isn't that really hot in Hawaii? Isn't it like really difficult to do? Or It was, no? it was in January. So it was cooler, but it was hot, you know, compared yeah. to what I was used to. So amazing. <laughs> amazing. And, and Trevor, how many did you do of those states? Like, have you done a, um, a few of them? Uh, I have. I think I'm up to like 17 marathons. I'm actually doing my 18th uh, in about 10 days from now. So. Brilliant. But he's done a lot of half marathons. A lot of yeah. the time where I'd be doing a marathon, um, he would do the half marathon. So yeah. he's probably run in most of those states as well. Yep. Yep. And you know what? I, I study genetics, right? I'm, um, we have a epigenetics and, and functional genomics um, arm to our business mm. and everybody is genetically different. So what I want, you know, when people listen to you and go, oh my God, she's amazing. She's on 50, you know, marathons and blah, blah, blah and, and 50 states and so on. Um, I want people to not take away from that, that they should be doing back-to-back marathons because um, even though, yeah, that's really cool to have these challenges. We're not all genetically set up for that. And we need to respect that That sometimes um, it's been fascinating, this journey of learning about genetics, you know, and like when I did my genetics, it came back, uh, actually, I'm really not suited to the super long distance running. And I was like, <laughs> whoops, <laughs> whoops, <laughs> is that why I've got all these health problems? Um, <laughs> and, and actually, my body is more set up. It doesn't mean I can't ever do an ultra marathon again, but it does mean if that if I want to have longevity and health for a long time, which I do now, because, you know, I'm from my 50s, so I want to, you know, make sure that I stay on top of things, um, that I shouldn't be doing back-to-back ultras and that my body is much more mm. suited to doing shorter and high-intensity sort of workouts and 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 lots of yoga and Pilates and things as well. Um, And so I just want people to take away from that is that everybody is different for some people, like my husband, he can run super, super long and it's genetically good for him to do that for me, not so much. Um, And and one of the other things that I've found like with in our running coaching, we get a lot of ladies, we probably have about 70% ladies in our um, run coaching community. And a lot of them are in their thirties, forties, fifties. Um, you know, it, it's not the best weight loss thing, is it, Angie? No, not for me, at least. <laughs> I started for weight I loss. I can gain weight while running marathons, you know, yeah. and even watching what I'm eating. So, yeah, it is yeah. definitely, it's tricky. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not. So just, want, yeah, people understand, like, if, they, if you're wanting to do um, a weight loss program, that would be, you know, a completely different program that I'd set you than if you're wanting to do marathons for the ch- challenge of doing a marathon. Um, because there is this misconception that, yeah, I run a marathon and I'll get really, really thin and slim. And no, I got fat at doing marathons. <laughs> In fact, mm-hmm. I mean, when I ran through New Zealand, I got, I, I put on weight and I was like running, you know, um, 70 odd kilometers a day. <clears throat> and I put on weight and I'm like, what the hell is this about? You know? Um, so <laughs> Um, everybody is different respect your genes respect your body and as Angie said at the beginning of this podcast um, compare yourself only to yourself unless you're in the Olympics and then you probably have to compare yourself (laughs) to the others but for most of us it is about you versus you and I think that's the beautiful thing about the sport that we can all do this together but it's actually each of our journeys Um, Mm. and yeah so okay Trevor what was your favorite race that you've done Oh, thanks for asking. There's this marathon I love to talk about. You've probably heard of it. It's the Young Frau Marathon in Switzerland. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's that's such a beautiful place. It's it's almost unreal, otherworldly, how beautiful it is there. Probably like New Zealand, actually. <laughs> yeah, otherworldly yeah. beautiful. I've, I've heard it's nice there, too. It's nice. It's very <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, I haven't been in New Zealand yet, unfortunately. So as of right now, Switzerland is, is, is my favorite place that I've run. Yep. They say that when, um, for those... Lord of the Rings nerds who might be listening when Tolkien after World War One was marching through the Lauterbrunnen Valley in Lauterbrunnen, Switzerland, and he sees this amazing place. And that was the inspiration for Rivendell. Oh, wow. From, in the book uh, and in the movies uh, where you the elves live. first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and then, the he came of- to New- then we came to New Zealand to film it because it was even better. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yep. But uh, that, 
what's cool about that marathon is it's uh it's just pretty much all up up this mountain till you get to this wow being feet i'm sorry <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. seven seven thousand feet elevation so um that it's pretty much a lot of power hiking Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Two and a half meters. It's pretty much a thousand. It's pretty much a lot of power hiking after the the second half, which is fine because I felt like uh, I was still making progress. But people were like throwing up on the side of the trail, and <laughs> I was fine because I was just I was just power hiking. I was kind of used to it. So that's been my favorite marathon thus far. Fantastic. Plus, they had this, this the Alphorns, Swiss Alphorns, and stuff. And oh, and it's very it transcendent. So yeah, it is so special. I lived in Austria for 13 years and would go over to Switzerland oh, wow. regularly and Austria and Switzerland, very similar. And just absolutely yeah. beautiful. I, I really miss the, the beauty of the place. It's just, a, you know, and the culture and the traditions and the, you know, all of, and the cool building, mm -hmm. all of those sorts of things. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty special. And what about you, Angie? What's your favorite race? Oh, I don't know. It's hard to hard to pick one. I would say my favorite international race was the Loch Ness Marathon in Scotland. <laughs> just going around Loch Ness, the lake, and just incredibly beautiful. Um, and just the chance to be able to be there and be in the country and see so many amazing things. But I don't know, you know, I mean, there's a lot of races that I love um, here in the US as well. Like you know, Boston is a very iconic yeah. and special race. Gosh, yes. um, the Marine Corps Marathon is is really like moving and that's uh, Washington D.C. Yeah, Washington D.C. And then uh, my home state is Montana, and so I've gotten to do a couple of marathons there. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm a little bit biased, but I love the mountains there. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And what was your for both of you? What is what was your toughest race? Or you know, what, have you ever have you ever not made the finish line? thankfully no oh, um, actually that one race that they closed the finish line oh wow oh yeah yeah, yeah, ran a marathon and, <laughs> yeah yeah that was in that was in austria in fact in 2019 they had to shut oh, the wow. course down because of the weather but i think that for me uh the toughest race was uh, 50k in montana that i was probably under trained because i'm so lazy and i ended up uh taking lots of lots of breaks like like laying on the ground <laughs> But I finished before the cutoff, and I wasn't I wasn't dead last, yes. so I was I was happy. Hey, you take whatever you can get when you you know go to the bottom of the barrel, yeah. and there's not much left. If you get, if you get across the finish line, that's exactly. pretty awesome. It was on the you? continental continental divide trail, so there was a lot of oh, elevation wow. gain. But how about you, Angie? Well, there have been a lot of marathons where I finished feeling like, or even ultras that I was dragging a body part behind me, but I was like <laughs> too stubborn to quit kind of thing. But yep. I think probably the mo most difficult one was the Leadville trail marathon mm. in um, Leadville, Colorado, because it starts at 10,000 feet and it just goes up from there. And there was a section, a one mile section to get up to Hope Pass, which was the highest point. And it took me 30 minutes to go a mile. I would just, it was like walk wow. a few feet you know, just like breathe, gasp for air, like pretend you're taking a picture because you're, <laughs> you're embarrassed at your pace. And that was, that was very challenging because I was not, we were living at, you know, sea level basically. Mm -hmm. And to go and do that, not being acclimated, it was, it was challenging. And then to look to the side of the trail and like, if I make a misstep, I'm going to fall off this mountain and oh. die. So, you oh, know, that's so <laughs> scary. Kind of one of those, one of those yeah. where I finished and I was just like, so thankful to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty damn scary. What, what, what do you think are the biggest learnings from all of these races and this journey that you've been on for, for however long you've been running for? What, what are some of the biggest takeaways? And do you think this crosses over into daily life, into your businesses, into your, to the work you do and stuff like that and challenges in, in your home life and stuff? Yeah, I would say the marathon and any long distance running is a great metaphor for life because you have to look at the long picture. And like you were saying earlier, you know, you're, we're always changing and evolving as people and we have to keep that in mind. And I've kind of through the years, um, through some trial and error, you know, my goal is to become, to be a strong, healthy runner for life. And so yeah. being healthy through that lifespan is way more important than any one race for me. Yeah. And I think that's, it's very important. Like, you know, we see people who are taking on these challenges and it is important to have goals and everything, 
But, um, I, you know, I think it's also important to just look at your overall health, you know, is your sleep, is your nutrition, um, is your overall strength, um, are your relationships good? You know, how is your, how is your mental and your emotional and your spiritual life? All those things go hand in hand. And I think that at some point running accomplishments are only going to be so satisfying if those other things aren't in place. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's been a big thing for me. Like I tend to be a like really goal oriented person, always looking to the future. Like, well, when this happens, I'm going to be happy and be satisfied. And I finally came to the realization that if I can't be happy right now in the imperfect, (laughs) you know, the way life is, if I can't be happy now that I'm not going to be happy in the future. And if I accomplish these goals, there's always going to be something else to chase. And so, you know, that's been something that I've been thinking about lately of, of just how to, how to really appreciate the present. And, um, and I think that really goes into running or whatever people's goals are, because there's going to be a lot of kind of of the present that is challenging and that we don't want to go through. And, you know, I think it's important to, to do hard things, take on hard challenges, but there's going to be a lot of hard things that find us that we don't want to have to deal with that we're going to be forced to wrestle with. And I think that having that long-term goal and, and having done hard things in the past prepares you for those challenges that, you know, you never wanted to take on in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, when you've, when you've been struggling, you know, look, um, going back to the genetics, you've probably got a, um, a dopamine thing where you have to, ch- you're chasing dopamine all the time. Like I know yeah. I've got that a, a gene called the DRD2 gene where I don't have a heck of a lot of receptors for dopamine. So I'm always chasing a mission and, and um, just coming to understand that about yourself. is like, aha, uh-huh, that's why I, I tend to, you know, like my brother said to me once, why are you always on a mission? Why can't you just sit on a beach and enjoy the day? And I'm like, it's like asking a table not to be flat and just <laughs> that's the way I am I get up and I'm missioning all day every day and and I'm like you Angie I'm trying to to change the the talk in my head to being present and sometimes like when you are going through challenges and you know life keeps chucking them at us at the moment um mm. it, it just you you don't want to be in the now so you and one of the big things that I really miss because I'm not doing ultras anymore um, is having that single focus one goal you know and life was purely about being a you know a selfish athlete who's just got on a mission um, mm-hmm. and I don't have the luxury of that now with with things in life and I miss that I miss that terribly you know that simple a simplicity of life where you you've got just this one big huge goal and you're doing your work and stuff but you know like this is the one thing and then when you're actually in the race that's what I found beautiful about racing was that you're not thinking about the mortgage and the you know what's going on in the family or anything else because you're just like I've got to get up this hill you know <laughs> make it to the next aid station <laughs> yeah and you're yeah. right in the moment and yeah. for so much of my life, I know that I'm in the future or the past, and it's mm-hmm. really learning to be in the now without having that singular, singular focus. Um, so mm-hmm. really wise words, and you think. And Trevor, what, what, do, what would you say that running has brought to your mental resilience and toughness and ability to cope with things? Well, I know running marathons makes a lot of other stuff seem easier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I remember how how tough my first half marathon was. And I thought I was going to die because mm. I was a pretty much a non runner previous to, to meeting Angie. So after I did my first full marathon man, a half seemed like a walk in the park, it seemed so easy. Uh, even though, you know, they're still challenging, especially if you're trying to race a half marathon, oh, <clears throat> but we, we've had a uh, Joe DeSena on our podcast a couple of times. He's the founder of the Spartan Race yeah, Series. Yeah, been on his show. Awesome. Oh, cool. Yeah, he's yeah, one he's, hard ass. <laughs> yeah, he's yes. a scary guy. <laughs> he's a scary guy. <laughs> so I, I'll always remember something he talks about in his book, uh, Spartan Up, and that's obstacle immunity. When you make yourself do hard things, you become oh, immune to obstacles that. in life. You can just push through them, hurdle over them, uh, but it's when you're playing it safe, when you're afraid to get out of your comfort zone, you know, sign up for that, that challenge, that marathon or whatever your, your challenge is, 
it's that's when you get more timid and you know hard, hard things seem harder than they really are probably yeah. and it's all in our heads ah oh, there's gold obstacle immunity that's going on my instagram today <laughs> 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 thanks joe <laughs> because it is like um um i think you you learn like when somebody or, 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 or when someone tells you you can't do something that's just like for me like Oh, we'll see. I don't agree with you. <laughs> and, and we'll find out, you know, and that's really served me well. Because in, in the more that you realize when people tell you you can't do something, and then you go and do it. Um, that that's just other people's limiting beliefs. And this is in all areas, you know, certainly in the, in the medical space and the, you know, with story with my mum, which my listeners know about, you know, if I'd listened to everybody telling me I can't do something, we would never be where we are now, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you have this mentality, you have, oh, obstacle, how do I get around it? What else can I do? Rather than, oh, obstacle, I have to stop and sit down and cry and that's it, you know. Um, yeah. And I think that mentality is, 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 is brilliant. So obstacle immunity, yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't mean that you don't feel those hard feelings as Obviously. you get over the obstacle. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's important sure to acknowledge that it's hard and, you know, take time to feel that frustration or that sadness or that disappointment. But I think also acknowledging those emotions helps you get over the obstacle too, because you're not fighting your emotions, then you're using those and, and using that to kind of fuel your fire to just do what needs to be done. Yeah. And you know what I think is beautiful too, is when you look back and you, you've overcome challenges, it makes you stronger for the next challenge. And this is, you know, you lift your horizon up every time. So you, you know, you get to the, you're into your first half marathon and you're like, for five minutes, you go, I never ever want to do that again because that hurts so much. And then the <laughs> next day you're on the internet, where's the next one? Where's the next challenge? And you can see runners do this over and over again. I just laugh now when they say I'm never doing that again. Um, <laughs> because it's usually like until the, the pain wears off and then they're off on the next mission. Um, yeah. And it is like lifting your horizon every time. And it's not something that stays out there permanently either, by the way, you know, like you build yourself up to marathon, ultra marathon, whatever your, your goal is. And then if you don't do it for a while, I can tell you as someone who's, you know, not doing ultras now, your world starts to shrink back in as to what you are capable mm. of doing. And, you know, for me, I'm like um, thinking, can I do a half marathon? You know, that's what I'm like, you know, like at the moment with the, with a the load that I've got on, which is a lot, um, can I get, can I get back to that stage? stage and you know like my focus has been on crossfit and other things so you know my body's changed considerably uh for the better i'd say but when it comes to going back long oh i've got to push that horizon back out again you know it doesn't stay out there permanently in other words it's, it's a constant work battle really to, to to keep it and when you're getting older You've also got that aspect coming into it too, like trying to keep things at bay. I had a the, you know, Dean on the podcast last week and we were talking about that because we, you know, we're both <laughs> somewhat <laughs> north of 40. Um, yeah. um, and, and it's like, yeah, things aren't quite working like they used to do. And I'm like, yeah, I'm working on that. I've got all these things for you, Dean. Like, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> some great longevity stuff. Come and try this, to do that, you know. Um, mm. And that's sort of a, a, an interesting path to go down to because you start to think well I can keep my fitness to the best that I can and I, by, by keeping up with the, the the current research and the knowledge and stuff and doing the best things and prioritizing things like sleep um, you know that you can have a massive impact on your body and it's not just about the training I think is is what I'm yeah mm. so guys you've also got three kids like three kids busy life running marathons most people go oh, I can't do that I've got you know how do you find the time well I mean we are very fortunate that now we are self-employed so we kind of can design our own schedules and I think that's a big advantage to the training um, because some days it happens at a certain time some days it has to be pushed around a bit because of you know 
um, appointments, mm -hmm. kids, yep. things that we've got going on and everything. And we've also tried to include our kids in the journey, especially when they were young, they would travel with us a lot yep. and they got to go to, you know, so many of the States that we traveled to and, you know, we've tried to expand their horizons as well. And now that they're older and everything, it's, you know, sometimes he travels and he's going to Italy um, next week and I'll stay home with the kids and then I'll go somewhere, you know, in September. So, you know, it's just about making it work and, you know, making sure, you know, the family is, is supportive. Um, and it's not like your family has to be like your biggest fans because there's only a certain they don't. level that your family is going to get it. Like our kids yeah. could pretty much care less that we do marathons. They're like, you know, so what, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I hear you. Like, <laughs> what are you making for dinner, mom? I don't care that you just ran a rate, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like they, they're very good at bringing you back down to earth family members. Oh yeah, they? exactly. I've got kids, but I've got brothers and uh, yeah, you know, um, you, you ran across the Sahara. Oh yeah, whatever. You know, like, you know, <laughs> Oh, you wrote a book. Oh, that's cool. I'll never read it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> what's it about? Okay. Oh, that's, that's cruel. Oh, yeah. 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 But that's same, and that's family and it keeps you, uh, keeps you grounded. It does. <laughs> and you're like, Oh, 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 would it be nice to get a pat on the back? <laughs> but no, I mean, I'm, I'm being, they're not like, they're not that bad at all. Um, very supportive actually. But when we were younger, that was definitely the case. Um, yes. <laughs> and I'm probably vice versa because they are great surfers and I'm always like, oh yeah, whatever, you're just riding 20 foot waves, that's cool. You know? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now I am sort of like, oh wow, that's pretty awesome. Go, go guys. It is. Um, like you guys have been epic today. Thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. I think you know what you your, your podcast and tell you know, tell everybody where they can find you. What you know what you where's the best home to find you on the internet and Instagram and all those sort of good places and you know how yeah. people connect. No problem. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be on the podcast. And if anybody wants to find us, you can just go to marathontrainingacademy.com. If you are looking for our podcast, if you just type in marathon training, we usually just come up as the, the first result, but it's called the Marathon Training Academy podcast. And then we're on Instagram at Marathon Academy. Wonderful. I will put all those in the show notes. Thank you very Perfect. much, guys, for your time today. It's been absolutely wonderful chatting with you. Thank you so much. Likewise, thank you. <laughs>